Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, as many of you know, our main focus with this project is the growing entanglement of the Christians with the state. And with that, I have had a growing interest of how the early church responded to the state. We have the writings of the early church in the Bible, but how did they respond past that? Were there more writings by Christians other than what we have in the Bible? It turns out that they were very vocal about how we are to respond to the state. This is going to be a great episode, and these guys have a lot of information to give us. I'm going to welcome back Keith Giles to the show. And I was scrolling through Facebook one day and came across a post by Craig Greenfield on his page, and it was a series of quotes from the early church. And I commented asking if he'd be interested in, in coming on the show, and he said, Jason Porterfield literally wrote the book on this subject, and it turns out he was correct. Jason wrote an ebook called 100 Early Christian Quotes on Not Killing. So I reached out to Jason to see if he'd be interested to come on the show, and he was happy to, and I hope you enjoy it. So, Jason, most people that are familiar with this podcast are going to be familiar with Keith, but uh, for those that might not be familiar with you, why don't you give us a little background of yourself? Sure, yeah. So I I grew up uh, in Pennsylvania for the most part and uh, grew up in a conservative Southern Baptist church, but then in college went to a, a college that was historically Anabaptist. Uh, and many of my Mennonite friends got me really thinking a lot about issues of justice, nonviolence, peacemaking. And uh, soon after college, I joined an uh, international community of Christians who live in some of the poorest parts of the world and do a lot of community development in those communities. Um, and so first I was in Canada's poorest neighborhood, which is actually in Vancouver, one of the prettiest cities in the world, uh, but it's got a place called the downtown east side. And then helped start a new community in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, in one of the slums there. Um, so that's some of my background experience. Now my wife and I and our family were in Houston, Texas, of all places. i have uh, originally from Texas myself. I've never been to, to Houston, but I've heard it is hot. Yeah. Keith, you want to give us some background of yourself as well? Yeah. So, yeah, my name's Keith Giles. I'm, a, I'm an author and... Uh... Formerly was a licensed entertained Southern Baptist minister for several years, also served a lot. And uh, my wife and I helped to plant a vineyard church in Southern California for several years. And then we eventually felt God calling us to leave and start a house church where 100% of the offering could go to help the poor in our community. And we started working with people living in motels there in Santa Ana, California, did that for about 15 years. And uh, we have moved uh, we no longer uh, live in Southern California. We have just moved to El Paso, Texas, uh, back in October of this year or last year, and um, and uh, we've also started working with an organization called Peace Catalyst International. And uh, what we're doing here in El Paso with them is helping to bring Christians and Muslims together over a meal called a peace feast, and uh, just share a meal, get to know each other, not for the purpose of arguing or debating who's right or wrong, but just to make friends and. Uh, peacemaking efforts, sort of uh, in the sense of listening and learning and befriending people who are not like us. So we're excited about that. Yeah, that's, a, that's excellent. Yeah, I saw, I've seen you post about that on Facebook. And that is, that is awesome, man. I, I love what y'all are doing with that, because mm. there's so much anger no. with Christians and Muslims, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, we're not going to agree on, you know, on what the Bible, but, but no. Jesus told us to love our neighbor, and that includes everybody. That's right. You know, right. and that includes Muslims. We're not supposed to kill them. <laughs> well, not only that, I mean, uh, I think some of the beautiful things that we've noticed, I mean, back even when we were doing house church, we had Muslims come and visit us, and uh, and they loved Jesus, and they were excited to learn more about Jesus, and that was a shock to us, you know, and I was like, wow, really? So that's one thing I think the average Christian just doesn't even understand is that the Quran talks about Jesus, the Muslims honor and revere Jesus and believe things about him that, uh, frankly, are astounding to the average Christian when they find out the kind of things that Muslims believe about Jesus that we have in common. 
And it's just a beautiful place to start a conversation. We have a really wonderful common ground, uh, and which is Jesus. So, you know, what better, what better subject for us to sit and talk about than Jesus? You know, when I, where I lived in Indonesia, the, the slum community was entirely Muslim. We were the only Christians. And um, this kind of might segue well into the topic today. But uh, one morning I was sitting outside our, our little shack and I was drinking a good cup of instant coffee when my neighbor came out and she had tears in her eyes. And she just said, why do Christians hate us Muslims so much? And I, I didn't, had no idea what she was talking about. So I knew I needed time to think and caffeine to think. So I, I took a long sip of my coffee and then just said, well, what makes you say that? And she said, why does a Christian pastor in the United States want to burn our Quran? And I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a pastor in Florida. This was maybe eight, 10 years ago. Oh, it was, Yeah, and it was the first I had heard of it. And I said, I don't know. But I can assure you, he's just one man. And as soon as I said those words, I wish I hadn't said them. And she, she latched onto those final words and said, just one man. You know, if it was just one man, why aren't the other Christians in your country trying to stop him? If it was just one man, it just escalated. And it culminated with her saying, if it was just one man, then why did Dutch Christians come and enslave my people for 300 years? And, I was, I was like, Whoa. <laughs> and in some ways, she was right, you know? Uh, yeah. Sadly, those of us who claim to be the bearers of good news are so often the bringers of bad news. Right. That's exactly right. Well, if you see, if you look at the, the American Christians and, and what they, a lot of this stems from their being involved with the government. Mm-hmm. You know, so when, you know, when 9 11 happened, that I was, and I was one of those guys too, man. I was like, we got to get them back. But I didn't know who we were going to get back. I just know that we were attacked, and so we we had to go get them back. And that I was all about, you know, let's go drop bombs wherever we had to, and so we can end this, and this never happens again. Well, tur- that has not helped anything. No, it's not. It's made it completely worse. Mm-hmm. And you know, and when people in other countries, you, when they when they see an American flag or they see our military occupying their countries, they don't see us as a Christian nation. We're not a Christian nation. There's nothing Christ-like about going and taking over their land or dropping bombs. What's going on in Yemen right now is, is awful. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're targeting uh, water yeah. sanitation facilities and hospitals, and they don't have clean water. So now the cholera outbreak is rising. You know, and this, it's, it's got to stop at some point. We have to stop supporting it. Yeah, that is, I agree with you. I think the Yemen, uh, it's the war, the, the famine, the disease, uh, it's uh, it's just horrific. And for the most part, it's ignored by the American press and the average person. The average American really knows nothing about it. Well, we don't hear about it. The media doesn't talk about it. Now, the only, the, the only way I know about it is by listening to other podcasts. Right. Podcasters are talking about this. But when people are latched on to, you know, government channels like mainstream media, they're not going to hear this. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. So let's start with the with the ebook and then we'll we'll get into Jesus Untangled as well. And in the introduction to this e- this ebook, Jason quotes uh, is Clement of Alexandria wrote in the second century, Christians are not allowed to correct by violence sinful wrongdoings. These words sum up well the church's original stance on violence. Under no circumstances, be it war, vengeance, or self-defense, were Christians permitted to harm another person. So central was this conviction that not a single writing from the church's first 300 years advocates otherwise. Now, and it says, sadly, few Christians still hold this view today, and those that do are usually dismissed as, as naive idealists. Now, Jason, was this your motivation to writing this ebook, or what, was, what, what, was, what made you want to put this together? Yeah, great question. Uh, I guess I'll give two, two answers. The first would be brief and just that there are definitely numerous scholarly books that compile the early church's attitude towards war and towards the state. Um, But they tend to be thick. They tend to be pretty dry and not very accessible. Um, And so I wanted to create a very concise ebook that just let the early church speak for themselves on the subject. So this ebook's just a one-page introduction, and then it's just a hundred quotes from the early church with the original sources listed. But what really, the day that really, uh, cemented my wanting to to write this book was, this was years ago, um, I was living in Canada, and my home church in Pennsylvania 
uh, knew that I was going to be coming back to share during missions week at a Christian college. And so they asked if I would preach uh, that Sunday in November. And so I said, sure. And then about, oh, maybe six days beforehand, my teammate, Craig Greenfield, who you mentioned at the start of the podcast, he came bursting into my room and he said, guess what? Guess what? Guess what day they asked you to preach on? And I said, I don't know, the second Sunday in November. He said, yeah, but guess what the date is? I said, I don't know. What is it? He said, it's November 11th, Veterans Day. And I just thought, oh, no, (laughs) there's a mistake here. You know, Uh, about half the congregation are in the military, including both my parents. (laughs) And, uh, And so there I was that Sunday. And uh, 30, 40% were in their military uniforms. They sang some very patriotic hymns uh, during the offering. They, they had a video playing on the screen that culminated at the end with three warplanes flying over uh, the crosses with red, white, and blue smoke trailing the planes. Then they brought in an American flag and pledged allegiance to an American flag and left it on the one side of the stage and then brought in a Christian flag and pledged allegiance to the Christian flag. And then it was my turn to preach. <laughs> and so there I was, you know, like the lone pacifist in the room, invited to speak on Veterans Day. Um, I still remember my teammates were there, two Kiwis and an Aussie, all in the back pew right next to the exit, ready for a quick escape. <laughs> and I was so nervous. Um, but what I knew and what I wished my, that congregation knew was that history was actually on my side on this. Because for centuries, the church throughout the world has paused on that very day, November 11th, to remember the life of a Christian soldier who refused to fight. And that specific act, Mm -hmm. uh, the name of that person was St. Martin of Tours. And uh, he grew up uh, born four years after the famous uh, Constantinian shift began in 312 AD. So he was born in 316. And his parents were in the military, so he was required to join the military against his will uh, when he became a young adult. And uh, mainly had a ceremonial role uh, leading the, the emperor in parades until his unit got reassigned to modern day France. And one day out there on a very cold day, he saw a beggar who had no clothes on. It was freezing to death. So he took off his cloak, cut it in half, gave half to the beggar, and then tried to keep warm with the remaining half. That night he had a dream in which Jesus says to all the angels around him, see uh, Martin here and how he helped me. So Jesus is the beggar. Uh, and the next morning or soon after there was a battle and he said to his superiors, superiors, I am a soldier of Christ. It is not permissible for me to fight. They ridiculed him as a coward. And he said, I would rather stand unarmed in the front of the ranks. Uh, I would rather be slain than slay. He said, uh, and miraculously he survived, uh, that battle. Uh, and it is that event, uh, that the church has paused for centuries to remember. And so for me, it this book came out of wanting, realizing that there's a great irony in the life of the church, that regardless of where Christians stand on this issue of the permissibility of violence, how Christians interact with the state, we at least need to know that a great shift has happened. Uh, and most Christians are completely unaware of that. Oh, no, I, I'm just sitting here nodding my head. And it's like, yeah, I've, I've had similar uh, experiences online trying to share some of those same quotes with people and stories with people. Um, because yeah, we, Christians seemed, you know, we, we really, uh, the average Christian in America really has no understanding of the fact that the way they behave, the way they practice their Christianity would have been completely shocking and foreign and strange to any follower of Jesus, you know, in the first 400 years of church history. Um, they would have thought it very odd not only that we would have a flag of the empire in our sanctuary, but that we would sing songs about it and uh, celebrate it and even look down on other Christians if they didn't participate in those kinds of things um, or participate in the military or participate in the, in the government. Um, and so when you try to show Christians these things, there's a major disconnect. I mean, they have half the time they can't even believe you, you know, <laughs> we just have no, just have no grid for what you're talking about. But if you can help people to see it and understand there's this deep and rich legacy of Christians, you know, beginning with the first disciples in the book of Acts, and then going through first century, second century, third century, um, this unbroken, unwavering voice that to a man says, we shall not do violence. We will not pledge allegiance to Rome. We have no king but Christ. 
um, you know, when you can see that, uh, it really is such a, I mean, it's a shock, right? I mean, to me, when I study those things and read those quotes, uh, looking at early church history, it's such an incredible contrast. You just kind of go, wow, what happened? How did we end up here? Because <laughs> it's so different. Well, yeah, and when you were talking about, when he was talking about when they had the flag on the stage, it reminds me, and I think we talked about this before, but well, I was, I spent a lot of time in Southern Baptist churches as well. And I remember sitting in, 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 in service one Sunday and it was the 4th of July or Memorial Weekend or something. I don't remember which one it was, but they had a, a flag on the stage and they had uh, service members, military members stand up so people could clap for them. We did the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And at the time, it didn't seem out of the norm to me. It seemed like, okay, you know, we're a Christian nation. This is what we're supposed to be. We should be doing this anyway. And looking back, there was, man, it, it makes my stomach turn because it's not, it's, it's, so, it, and it's like you said, it's such a contrast. You don't, what did happen? Where did the, where did this, where did this change happen after the, after the four, first 400 years where we got so entangled with all this and it's just gotten worse? You, you look at, um, if when you, when you know, we're coming up on the next election cycle and Christians are going to go to the polls and vote in droves for Donald Trump because he's got a certain letter by his name. And you can, if you can't look at Donald Trump and see that there's nothing Christ-like about this man, but you as a Christian are going to go try and put this man back in power, I don't know, man. There's a, there's a huge disconnect. Yeah, absolutely. And we have talked about this. You know, I think last time I was on, we talked about this. Um, and, I'm, and I'd love to hear Jason's perspective on this too, but um, it really does seem that that shift that happened um, was really when Constantine, who was uh, who was Caesar, uh, the emperor of Rome, um, had a what he says was a conversion experience. Uh, I, I personally doubt that, but anyway, he believes he had a conversion experience with Jesus. Uh, but even in the way he had the conversion experience, was a, he saw this sign of Jesus in the sky, and he heard the words, "By this you shall conquer." This was, by the way, the night before he's about to go into battle. So he sort of paints this symbol on uh, the shields and the breastplates of his soldiers. They go into battle and they just slaughter, you know, the enemy. And therefore, oh, Jesus is a good guy. And Jesus just blessed me going in to kill lots of people. And so that was his conversion experience. And um, that kind of is a, tells you what you need to know about uh, how Christianity started to shift uh, once Constantine you know, proclaims that he is a follower of Jesus, but obviously he's a very different kind of follower of Jesus than any actual Christian up to that point. Because uh, not only is he doing violence, he's using the symbols of Jesus to to win battles, to to slay his enemies. Um, but then, you know, the, ultimately what he does is he weds the church with the state. So there's an entanglement between the church and the state. Um and uh, that, to me, is kind of where it all began. That's when we started to go south. Uh, luckily, there were some Christians at the time who refused to play ball, but not enough of them. So they were in the minority. The majority of the Christians played along. And just over the, over the centuries, that entanglement has gotten stronger and stronger to the point where we are today, where uh, you can be a follower of Jesus uh, and and salute the empire and even send your children to die for the empire and even believe that that is of course the most christian thing you can do which again early christians would have looked at you and really scratched their head they wouldn't have understood what you were talking about well you said something earlier that that is so true too because today in today's christianity if you if you would refuse military service you would be considered a coward if you did not, if you refused to be a part of any of the political system, you were saying, you know, you were just letting the other team win and you're looked down on, you, you know, it's, it's, it's tough as, as, as a, as an anarchist, it's, it's tough to, as a Christian, it's tough to explain this to a, another Christian that is entangled with the state. You know, they're all about fight makes right. You know, we, we've got to, <laughs> but we can't be entangled with it. We can't be a part of this. And it, cause it goes against everything Jesus taught us. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the first uh comments people will make uh when when you introduce all this this information about the early church and its attitude, uh its view of the on the impermissibility of violence is they'll 
they'll assume then that then means that they did nothing. So it's really important to differentiate that that this was an active, nonviolent love that they had. Um, in fact, I would argue that the church grew the fastest because of how they cared for their enemies and how they cared for the poor in the first few centuries. It stood out. And, and in that ebook, some of the quotes actually are non-Christians writing to political leaders describing the life of the early church and making the comment that even though they refused to fight for us, they've done more to improve society than anyone else. Look at how they care for the, our own poor better than we do. Uh, comments like that. I love what you just said about, about it being active. We're not sitting around doing nothing because this this has come up a couple times in some episodes that I've recorded recently with Abby Kleckner, who writes for our blog. She's a pacifist and and she talks about and I, when I recorded with Bruxy Cavi the other day from the Meeting House in Canada, um, he was he he said this basically the same thing. It's it's a, we are actively working towards peace. I've struggled with pacifism. And I've never looked at it that way. I, I looked at it, you know, we're just not doing anything. We're going to get hit on the face and we're just not doing anything about it. But no, we're actively, we are actively working for peace. And uh, Scott Goldman, who writes for a blog, I recorded with him earlier. He said something, he coined a phrase and I'm trying to get somebody to write an article on it, but it was, it was perfect. He goes, we're going to call it aggressive pacifism. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, if you guys have ever heard of their, this organization, Jeremy Courtney started called preemptive love. Um, and it's kind of along those same lines. It's it's absolutely. If you look at the early church, they were not passive. It, that that that's where like the term passivism, I think, is is deceptive. It's not doing nothing. In fact, it's impossible for you to uh, to accurately follow Jesus as he c- tells you to follow him. To be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, and do nothing. Like you, you're not a follower of Jesus if you're doing nothing. You're doing all kinds of stuff. It just doesn't involve being involved in the military or politics or any of these other things. But you're doing all kinds of things. In fact, you're doing the kinds of things that might get you killed. And as we know from the early church, that is what happened, right? They were very vocal in that, no, we will not participate in this system. No, we do not believe these things. No, we will not participate in these things. Um, And so there is a preemptive love or a proactive agape, if you will, that um, is a radical kind of action that that does call attention to the difference. So the, the early church uh, believe, prescribed as something kind of, um, they call it the two kingdoms rule. Um, and they very much believed that, you know, before Christ, they were part of the kingdoms of this world, which to them would have been the Roman Empire. Um, and so when they came to Christ and proclaimed, gee, there's another king, right? It says in Acts, proclaiming an, there is another king, one whose name is Jesus. Um, there was this radical kingdom shift where, oh no, we're now in the empire of Christ. We're in the kingdom of Christ. He is Lord, which means Caesar is not. And that means we're going to behave and live and act uh, very, very differently from our neighbors. And that was very obvious. So, you know, anyone that lived next door to a follower of Jesus in the first, second, third century, they, there's no way they didn't know it because they noticed that these followers of Jesus were very, very different from any, but from themselves and or anyone else around them, they did care for the poor. They did bury the dead of not only the Christian but also the pagan. They rescued uh, babies, infants that had been left out in exposure to die uh, by the pagans, and and raised them as their own. They, you know, they were doing incredibly beautiful, radical, Christ-like things that got them noticed, and then sometimes got them arrested, tortured, and killed. I was, if I could make a maybe a timeline here, starting with you know with Jesus. I think I think we overlook that that he chose the slogan the kingdom of God. Uh, you know he could have talked about the family of God, the people of God, the community of God, but instead he chose this politically loaded slogan. Um, and then you've already referred to it, Keith. But in Acts, you know it says uh, Peter says we must obey God rather than any human authority. And then it's said of the Christians later in Acts that they're guilty of treason against Caesar for their profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. And that that theme runs through the early church. Um, I, I hear kind of in the, at the midpoint between Anabaptists and kind of conservative evangelicals are those who talk about Christians are dual citizens. And in my opinion, uh, that's not the language I see in the early church. They talk about being resident aliens. Uh, I think it was Bonhoeffer who said, our hearts have room for only one all-encompassing allegiance. Uh, and that would be the mentality of the early church. So just a few little lines, Tertullian, who has a lot of great quotes, said, uh, shall we carry a flag 
its arrival to Christ. The divine banner and the hum- human banner do not go together. One soul cannot serve two masters, God and Caesar. Uh, lots of quotes like that. Uh, in fact, no, I love even uh, Constantine's son was tutored by uh, Lactantius, I think is how you say his name. Uh, and he has some great lines as well. And I, you just kind of wish Constantine and his son had picked up on it. He said stuff like, For how can he be just who injures, hates, despoils, kills? And those who strive to serve their country do all these things. For what are the interests of one country but, to inconvenient, but the inconveniences of another state or nation? That is, to extend the boundaries which are evidently taken from others, to increase the power of the state, to improve the revenues, all which things are not virtues, but the overthrowing of virtues. And so there was this strong uh, stance in the early church. And I, uh, I'm really glad you brought up that, that Battle of Milvian Bridge, that turning point for, for Constantine, where he at least claims, right, like you said, Keith, to have had this vision, uh, in this sign of Jesus, you will conquer. Um, and that really was a shift. And one of the things that concerns me, though, is I think a lot of Christians would claim that that shift has been undone. Uh, that we now talk about the separation of church and state. Um, but it's so entangled, to use your word there, Keith. Um, oh, and I, yeah, yeah. I often think about it with the language of perspective. So, like, so I have a dry erase marker in front of me right now. And if I look at it from its end, it looks just like a circle. But if I turn it 90 degrees, it looks like a rectangle. It's this idea of perspective that where you stand determines what you see. And in that Constantinian shift, my concern is, that we went, the church went from being on the margins of society to being in the center, from being amongst the powerless to being the ones with the power. And to go back to your point about no one knows anything about Yemen because the major news entities aren't talking about it, what that shift also did was it went from the church being amongst the voiceless to being the ones with the voice. And even though we talk about separation in church and state now, the church still tries to be at the center, still is grasping for power, and still tries to have a loud voice. And I, I've i found, and I'm curi- I'd am i be curious to hear, Keith, some of your journey on this, because I, I looked and saw some of the books you've written, uh, but I found like the missions group that I was with, this group of Christians who have all left good-paying jobs and moved to be in solidarity with the poor, they didn't start out with a commitment to nonviolence. But when they moved back to the margins of society, they pretty quickly saw just how much the poor are disproportionately affected by violence and eventually came to have a a strong commitment to nonviolence in their writing, in their statement of belief and action documents. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the most um, pivotal kind of paradigm shifting moments in my life was um, I ran across this document written by a guy named Ray Mayhew. And it was called, the title of it was, uh, it was a little PDF, like 30 something pages long. It was called Embezzlement, the Corporate Sin of American Christianity, which sounds so radical, but, uh, and it is, but all it really is, is a, uh, he starts with the book of Acts and, and then he goes throughout church history, all through the first, second, third century, uh, and documents specifically how caring for the poor was at the DNA, the heart of the Christian church. And in fact, how the radical love that the Christians had for the poor among them, the, the poor among them and even the poor outside of the church, um, was more powerful than even the miracles that were done. More, more powerful than the, than the evangelistic crusades of the apostles, you know, not crusades, but the, the, the evangelistic efforts of the apostles. Um, it was simply that people noticed how they cared for the poor in such a radical way. I mean, to the point where I mean, this is just one of the stories that, that are, that's in this uh, document I read. Um, one of the examples is a man, uh, a traveler, comes into a, a village, and it's predominantly a Christian sort of community. And they had already, and like every week what they would do is they would, everyone would bring their money uh, into the, sort of to the elders. They would take their offering, and they would divide it up among the, the, you know, the, the poor and the orphan, the widow, and the people among them that needed food. And they had already done that. They had just done that already. And so no one had anything. And then here comes this traveler. He comes into town. He's also a believer. And not only do they fight one another for which of them is going to let him sleep in their house, because they wanted to be the ones to, to bless him. They also fasted 
during the, that, that week that he was stayed with them and gave this stranger their food to eat because they didn't have any money to, you know, to get any food for him. They'd already passed it out. And when I read that just beautiful expression of just immediate love and compassion for a total stranger, like it just made me stop and think, wow, would I even think of that? You know, I think, I think honestly, I'd be like, well, sorry, buddy. Yeah, we already passed up, you know, all the offering for the poor and, you know, the, uh, the basket's empty. Sorry, you know, <laughs> but, but it's like, they didn't even blink. It was just absolutely, no, 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 I'm gonna, you're going to stay at my house and you're going to eat my food. And then I'm not going to eat this week so that I can give you my food. And they were eager to do that. They just, they couldn't wait to do that. And so that kind of a thing really spoke to my wife and I. You know, we, at the time I read that, we were already doing some work with the church we were at, uh, trying to help people living in poverty and things like that. Um, but those kinds of stories, reading that kind of reaction that the early church had to the poor, people living in poverty, it really did open my eyes, like how different the church used to be, how the church really um, dominantly was the poor. It made it was made up of the poor. They were the, themselves the outcasts of society. Um, and how often, even if people came to them who had power and who had influence, let's say somebody was a senator or somebody was, uh, you know, in the military, um, the rule was, well, you have to renounce those things if you want to be a part of us. That's part of what it means to follow Christ. Uh, you need to give up those things. And it's so interesting to me how, I mean, here's another radical thing. Sorry, I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of rambling, but, but here's the other radical thing. Um, the way, even in the book of Acts, uh, the way they responded to poverty was they, they sold their property, they sold the things they owned, and, and divested themselves of their own property in order to share you know, food and sustenance with the poor among them. That's a very different posture. In other words, what they're doing is they are becoming poor themselves. They themselves are willing to move down into poverty to sell off things they own that are of value. And the more they do that, the more the more poor they are becoming, right? I used to own that property, but I don't own that property anymore. I used to have this, but I don't have it anymore. I sold it. I got rid of it. Now, they themselves are becoming poor in order to care for the poor, which is even different than, than the way we in the West approach it. The way we in the West approach caring for the poor is to try to bring them up to our level. We want, we want to bring them up to middle class, right? Let's get them training and a job. And, and I'm not saying that's the wrong approach. I'm just saying those early Christians had an automatic, instant reaction, which was to say, I'm willing to immediately meet your need by giving up something of my own uh, and to, to, to move into solidarity with you and your poverty. That's radical. That's pretty crazy. Hey, folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. In this introduction in the ebook, I found this, you quoted a friend of yours, his name is Eddie Hall. And he said, and you said, uh, what sports, some of the, the quotes in this ebook are from Christian leaders who were taught directly by the apostles. Yep. And that's great because I can compare that to like when I started studying the United States Constitution. If you just read the Constitution on its face, but you don't go to like the, the, the writings of the founders or like to the, uh, the state conventions for the, uh, the ratification uh, conventions to see what they were actually saying, what the meaning behind the Constitution is, then you can make that Constitution say whatever you want. And it's, then it happens quite a bit with, with, uh, with the government anyway. So to me, it seems like Christians are very lazy. And they, and they just want to listen to something like something their pastor says. They don't want to do their own research on some stuff. But if you can go back to the early church and, and read these quotes on how they perceive government, it doesn't take very long. It just takes a little bit of your time. Then this quote by Eddie Hall, I'm going to read this quote. It says, when you want to better understand the teachings of Jesus, it can help to look at the lives of the early Christians. The apostles learned much more from watching and listening to Jesus 
than could be included in the, in the Gospels. While the writings of these early Christians don't have the authority of Scripture, they give us valuable insight into how the apostles and those who learned directly from the apostles understood and practiced Jesus' teachings. And that's why I think this ebook's great because you can just go back and read what they're saying. This is what they, this is how this is how they perceive government or or nonviolence. There's stuff out there. There's resources out there for us to learn from. And I love the fact that there's there's writings past the Bible that we can go back and read and look on. Yeah, you know, one of my concerns is uh I think for most Christians, we only listen to contemporary Christian voices. And in doing so, uh, we not only deny the fact that the Holy Spirit's been guiding the church throughout time and place, um, but we also become prone or susceptible to latching on to whatever the latest Christian fad is. And so it's important to listen to what those who have come before us have to say. Well, I mean, they were just like, just like you said, they were directly taught by the apostles. I mean, who has a better understanding of what Jesus taught than they did? They walked around with him all over the place. Yeah. And just like you said, it's not recorded. In the, you know, some of that's not recorded in the gospel, but they were there and if they were taught by the apostles, they're going to have a better understanding than we are of what Jesus taught. Yeah, they, they definitely had a Christ-centered ethic. And, and if you read those early church fathers' quotes, they're appealing, like the reason why they're saying Christians shouldn't do violence, the reason why they're saying Christians shouldn't be involved in politics or government, um, it's not because they never appeal to that because Rome is bad. It has nothing to do with that. It's always based on because Jesus disarmed Peter, because Jesus told us to love our enemies, because Jesus told us, because Jesus was tempted in, by Satan, um, you know, to, to take political power over the kingdoms of this world. And he saw that as a temptation of the evil one. Those are the reasonings why they give for not doing those things. It's, it's all because of Jesus. And that's radical. And I think that's the kind of thing that I think we're missing. Yeah. If, if I may, I'd like to list a few of the factors, the, the pieces that chipped away at the, church, this, the church's original embrace of nonviolent. Because I, to, maybe to use your language, Keith, I, I tend to use the language of rebuilding. But to untangle the mess that we've made, we've got to find the, those pieces that got tangled. And so we've talked about, one, this idea of perspective changing. So um, I don't know about you guys, but when I've had conversations with other Christians about nonviolence, it usually goes nowhere. <laughs> and it, um, but if we put back in place some of those pieces that were removed, that we learned from church history. So um, maybe it would be good to give a little more detail on, on how the shift happens. So one thing that is true is that um, there's not a single writing that we have found uh, in which Christian writing we found from before the time of Constantine, in which the writer approves of Christians hurting others. Not a single one. Uh, unanimous in their writing. But what is also true is starting in about 180 is the first, 188, I think, AD, is the first time there's a writing in which we hear of some Christians in, in the military. And it was probably, historians think it was probably soldiers who came to um, follow Christ while they were already in the army. Now, the writer of those documents, though, condemns that and says they got to leave the military. But that's the first mentioning of that. Um, and then over the next century, um, leading up to the time of Constantine, they start to grapple with the issue of membership. Before it was a theological question, there was no debate theologically. It's not okay for Christians to use violence. But there was a debate about uh, on the idea of membership. Uh, should we allow them to join the church? Uh, can they stay in the military if they promise not to kill, for example? Could we then have them as members? Um, and all the writings we have say no, but you can start to see they're debating about that. Uh, so there's a membership issue. And you're exactly right, Keith, that also in these writings, it's 100% Christ-centric. Uh, it's a, a Jesus hermeneutic. Uh, Jesus is the lens through which they read all of Scripture. Um, but after Constantine, we began to see Christian writers justify Christians using violence with Old Testament precedents, uh, examples from the Old Testament. Um, and it reminds me of, of, of the disciples in the Gospels when I think it was a, a Samaritan village uh, tells Jesus to go away. And, and some of the disciples say, Lord, should we ask uh, God to send down fire and consume them just like Elijah did? Which actually wasn't is a misreading of that passage. But anyways, they appeal to Old Testament precedent. 
And Jesus said, no, you do not know what manner of spirit I am of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, it says in that passage. So even Jesus there is saying, no, you know, um, but after the Constantinian shift, Christians began to justify their violence with Old Testament passages. Instead of realizing that if Jesus is the clearest image of God, then he is the lens through which we read all of scripture. So in my mind, if we're going to untangle this, there's m- numerous threads we need to pull on. <laughs> we need to change our perspective. Uh, we need to stand in solidarity with the poor again and listen to them far more than we talk. We need to allow Jesus to be the lens through which we read scripture again, which is one of the reasons why I think the Anabaptists have a strong nonviolent stance is because they have that Christ-centered hermeneutic for the scriptures. Um, another factor actually started with Justin Martyr, uh, this dualistic idea that the universe can be divided into the spiritual realm and the physical realm. Justin Martyr, he was uh, mid-2nd century, if I'm remembering right, so pretty early on, and um, the emperor was persecuting Christians, and so he wrote uh, his first apology to try to tell the emperor, hey, you don't need to be afraid of us. You don't need to persecute us. And in that, he quotes Jesus's famous render unto Caesar line. And then he has this sa- statement where he says, whence to God alone we render worship and all other things we gladly serve you, Caesar. Now, Justin was not born a Christian and he was not a Jew. Uh, he grew up learning Uh, from Aristotle and Socrates, and their dualistic thinking that divided the world into spiritual and physical. Um, I'm sure, I don't doubt his faith. After all, he died a martyr. He died because of refusing to do the very thing he said belonged to God alone, (laughs) giving his worship. Um, But that dualistic thinking got picked up by the church, and you you had Augustine that picked up on it, and then you had Luther that picked up on it during the, the Reformation, and he took it a step further and said, yeah, there's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of the world, and there's actually two different ethics for how we are to live in each. And we got to undo that dualistic thinking, because that no Jew would have understood that in a dualistic way. Everything belongs to God. Everything. I think that's what's missed sometimes whenever the, the, the render under Caesar, what is Caesar's? Because in the end, it all still belongs to God, regardless. Yeah. That scripture is used a lot as, as Christian anarchists. We get that a lot, a lot. The render under Caesar, Romans 13, all that, all that stuff. It is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I could, we could talk forever on both of those passages. Um, But the one thing I would say about the render under Caesar is just the questioners uh, said, is it right to pay the tax? And Jesus changes the verb. And he says, uh, he uses a different verb in Greek, the verb repay, give back, return. And to answer the question of give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God's what is God's, it, he's basically saying to answer your question about whether to pay tax, there's a deeper question to ask, what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar? Does that make sense? Right. And any Jew with even a cursory understanding of the Hebrew scriptures would have known everything belongs to God. <laughs> right. There's nothing uh, it's left. A ref- <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what's left for Caesar? So what do the religious leaders do? A couple of days later, they accuse Jesus of refusing to pay taxes. Right. They understood. <laughs> so. exactly, exactly. No, that's exactly right. You know, and this is the other thing I think um, that we can, we can look at that Constantine, unfortunately, did. Um, he sort of redefined what it meant to be a Christian. Uh, because, again, prior to Constantine, um, it was pretty clear that being a Christian meant you put the teachings of Jesus into practice. So there was a very strong emphasis on orthopraxy, the, the way you lived your life. And with Constantine, it uh, almost immediately became more about, this is why he was very focused on, uh, let's, um, you, you know, let's canonize the scripture, or let's come up with these creeds, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's nail down the tenets of the faith, because he he redefined Christian Christianity as these are the things we believe, and so then it became much more emphasis on orthodoxy. And then the reason, one of the byproducts of that, of course, is that if you define Christianity by believing a certain set of doctrines, then that means my orthopraxy can be, uh, oh, I can take a sword, I can join the military, because all the, all I have to do to be a Christian is to say I believe these things. That makes me a Christian, and now where do I sign up? Let's go to let's go kill, you know, a bunch of enemies of Rome. And that was exactly 
that is the byproduct. I don't think that was an accident. I think that was very strategic because that was the result. And then the irony, this is the ultimate irony. The Christians who went along with Constantine's shift at the time partially did so because they recognized that it was a good thing to have a friend in the Caesar if the Caesar was saying, hey, I'm, I'm one of you guys. And so that meant, you know, after having gone through hundreds of years of uh, persecution, intense persecution and torture and uh, death and all these things, um, well, now the Caesar's on our side. And so finally, they're thinking, um, the sword will, will finally come off of the neck of the church. And he, here's what's happened, though. What, what happened was when they went along with Constantine's shift, um, the only thing that shifted was who was holding the sword. The sword remained at the neck of the church, but the difference was instead of Rome holding the sword, it was Christians holding the sword. And Christians, very, within, I think, 40, 30, 40 years uh, of Constantine, Christians were killing other Christians who didn't agree with them uh, theologically. I want to read something in this book uh, called The Early Christians in Their Own Words by Everhard Arnold. And it's just a, a polycarp. I guess it's before they were going to kill him. He said, 86 years have I served him, and he has never done me any harm. How could I blaspheme my king and savior? And then you read a little bit. And when he, made, he made it clear who his king was, you know, when he said that. And then and you read down a little further in this, in this part of the book. He said, for we have been taught to pay respect to governments and authorities appointed by God as long as it does us no harm. And I, I've read this, and I, and I was reading this, preparing for this episode, and I, and I guess I missed that before, but when he says, as, as long as it does us no harm. Now, if you look at government, is there anything that government does that does not cause somebody somewhere some harm? I can't think of anything. I'm mean, honestly, I, I can't think of anything, any action that government takes is not done some harm to Very somebody little. else. <laughs> and you said that was Polycarp. Did I hear that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, it, it reminds me, I don't want to say too much on Romans 13, because I know you have another episode coming out on it. But Paul, after saying submit, which is not to obey, you know, the governing authorities, he gives a litmus test. And it's that exact same language. He says, okay, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you owe dues, pay dues. And then he says, but owe no one anything but love. And then just in case love's too ambiguous of a concept, he defines it. He's, he says, because love does no harm to another. In other words, Paul just drew a line in the sand. It basically says, if, you're, if your country asks of you, demands of you to do something that would harm another, you don't owe it to them. Right. And, you know, and if you think about the taxes that are, that are taken from us, and, you know, and people say, well, we need, to, we need these taxes so we can help the you know for the welfare of, of other citizens but there's very little of that money used for welfare and the majority of that money is used to drop bombs in other countries killing children they're dropping bombs on weddings on hospitals on farmers people just living their own lives that's the majority of the money that is stolen from us is is, is used used for that and if you, get, if you get people to understand that it's difficult to get people to understand that when you mentioned what paul said in romans and it's it's and when I said Romans 13 is used against us quite a bit, he did say submit. And if you look at the Greek wording of submit compared to obey, it's two different definitions. He did not say submit in obeying the government. And I love using the, the example of Rosa Parks with this, because when, when she defied the ridiculous law that she had to set somewhere on a bus because of her skin color, and the bus driver said, if you do not move, I'm going to have to call the police. And she said, you may. But she didn't move. She, did, she disobeyed the law. But when the governing authority showed up, she submitted to them without any violence. Yeah, exactly. Submission, submitting is respectfully accepting the consequences, whether one must obey or disobey. Right. Yeah. It's sad how so many lob that passage uh, and don't realize that they're using it in the very same way it's been used to justify Holocaust, slavery, apartheid, segregation, you name it. Well, they, they read Romans 13 without reading Romans 12. <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. Exactly. Romans 12 is the instruction for Christians. That's, that's what Christians are supposed to follow is Romans 12. Romans 13 is, is guidelines for the, the state and how we uh, it maybe interact with the state or how we uh, regard the state. But it's, 
Romans 13 is not necessarily instructions for Christians. That's for the state. Romans 12 is for what the followers of Jesus are supposed to do. Well, it's, it's funny. Uh, I mentioned Bruxy Cavi in this YouTube video that I was watching that was sent to me before I reached out to him about coming on. He said in this video, he said, don't get mad at the state for doing state stuff. He said, we may have some very strong opinions on what the state's doing, but don't, they're doing state stuff. <laughs> and, he, and he said, you got to go back. And he goes back to Romans 12. And you go, and, and we, that's what we talk about in, in the episode that I recorded with. And that guy's incredible. Oh, I love Brux. But Keith, let's, uh, uh, let's get into Jesus Untangled just a little bit. This book, to me, is, is a must read for Christian anarchists. Now, I don't, I don't know if you subscribe to Christian anarchy or not, but to me, when I was reading this, I was applauding all the way through. But chapter three, it says, The way we were, the church before entanglement. And you quote, um, I'm going to probably murder this name. Is it Jacques Ellul? Yeah, Jacques Ellul. Jacques Ellul. Okay, it says, Politics is the church's worst problem. It is her constant temptation, the occasion of her greatest disasters, the trap continually set for her by the prince of this world. And you know, we talked mm -hmm. about uh, the Jesus' temptation uh, to have all of the kingdoms, the, world, the kingdoms of this world. He rejected that. Yeah. I mean, there was, he had no interest in that whatsoever. And, he, and he, he goes on later to say, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then, they, then my followers would fight. Right. Exactly. I want to read something you said in, in chapter 3. It kind of, kind of plays off of Romans 13. It said, Paul affirmed in Romans 13 that the state served a purpose to wield the sword and maintain civil authority, but that the church served a higher purpose to carry the cross and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, our kingdom. No king but Christ. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is. And see, that is what you see when you study, first of all, the teachings of Jesus. And then second of all, the, 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 the early church fathers, that um, that is exactly what they understood Jesus to be saying. There was no confusion for them about that. Um, there's also another verse, I think, that's a companion to those other verses uh, where Paul talks about how he says we carry weapons of righteousness in both hands. And um, of course, these weapons are not actual weapons. They're not, they're not real swords. They're not actual clocks. <laughs> you know, he, Paul talks about these spiritual weapons, right? Because our enemies aren't flesh and blood. Our enemies are spiritual, right? And so when, we, when you fight like a Christian, uh, what does it look like? Well, you're not killing any human beings because they're not your enemy. Flesh and blood is not your enemy. So you're going to battle in, in sort of maybe in a spiritual sense, maybe with prayer, um, maybe by the way you follow Christ in, in a radical way, the way you care for the poor and things like that. The, this is the way you, a Christian might fight, uh, again, not violently, but to resist evil and to uh, resist injustice and speak out against those things. And um, the, the, this is the way we're told to, to battle and to fight. and. Um, if Christians could understand that, again, it's not about doing nothing. Um, I think I make the point in the book about that, that um, if Christians are, are holding weapons of righteousness in both hands, that means we're holding a cross. That means there's nowhere to hold a sword, right? And in fact, when the church picks up the sword, it lays down the cross. Uh, we have to choose, right? The cross is an instrument. It is an instrument of death, ironically. The cross is an instrument of death, but the only one who dies is me. Uh, it's about my dying to myself so that I can live for Christ. Um, it's not an offensive weapon to anyone else. It's something where that, uh, you know, where I'm laying down everything for the cause of Christ. And again, if we could get that, if we could understand that, um, I wish we could. Unfortunately, it seems that we're blinded by uh, nationalism and politics. And um, uh, it's kind of a flat Bible perspective of Scripture that, uh, again, we have to go appeal to the Old Testament, Joshua rather than to listen to Jesus. Right. And you, you quote, uh, is David Burko? Did I say that? Yeah, Burko, yeah. They said, uh, for the early Christians, it wasn't a matter of lip service. It was a stark reality. They truly were citizens of a different kingdom than the people around them. And the Romans took note of this. How different, how peculiar these Christians were. And you guys are the experts on this. And I don't want to keep y'all too long. We, we could probably talk for hours about this. I know I could. I'm having a lot of fun with this episode so far. But he said, from the earliest writings of the apostles through the second and third centuries, the church resisted military involvement and refused engagement at the political level. 
Is there any evidence from the early church prior to Constantine? Was there any evidence of them being involved with uh, politics, you know, running for office or voting for uh, political office or being involved with the military? Hmm. Well, uh, Jason mentioned, and I think what he had in mind were the rain soldiers. Is that what you were talking about, Jason? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Which is an interesting, uh, so, so yeah, that, in other words, that is an example of prior to Constantine. Uh, there's a very famous story of Christians who were uh, part of an army. And there's a pretty, pretty amazing testimony, basically, of this uh, army that was marching and they had been, they were out in the middle of nowhere and they were like dying of, of thirst. And uh, they prayed. And it rained, but it only rained on them. It didn't rain on their enemies. And they caught water in their shields and their helmets and drank it and were strengthened and refreshed. Um, and uh, so the, the commander of, the, of that army kind of tells that story. Uh, but but it, it's an incidental story, but he mentions in the story that it, were, it was the Christians in his service in the army, in the military, that had prayed and that had happened. Now, a lot of, a lot of uh, Christians who want to uh, justify violence. We'll look at that story. And this is how, honestly, I heard about this story was somebody came back to me and said, well, what about this? This proves you're wrong, Keith. So, and at first I was like, oh crap. <laughs> oh boy. I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. So I went and studied it and looked at it. <laughs> and it's, and actually I was, I actually was thankful because I'm like, thank you for this story. Because actually what it shows when you look at the, the full story, um, what you see is, and I think it's even the commander, I can't remember the guy's name, do you remember the name of the commander of the army? I don't know. No, anyway, it's been a long time since I read that story. Yeah, I've got a blog post I wrote about it. But anyway, it's um, the commander of that army, if you keep on reading, uh, this is, this is by the way, the trick with even with scripture. Somebody quotes something, just keep reading, okay? Yes. <laughs> if you keep on reading, what you'll notice is he actually makes the point of saying that these uh, Christians that were in his army um, refused to fight. They would not shed blood. So what they were doing, they were carrying the armor, they were cooking the food, uh, they were doing you know, medical work, healing the people that were injured. In other words, these were, um, the, the assumption is what we think is it, what's happening at the time was, there was a whole lot of poverty at the time. Um, they, many people were conscripted to serve in the military by Rome. In other words, you didn't really have a choice. But because of their faith and their desire not to do violence, they, and there were so many of them, they were allowed to serve in the military and, and basically get a wage and, you know, be able to eat and have some kind of income. Um, and, and they were given an accommodation. Well, you can do these other things since you don't want to go to, to war and engage in war. So, so that is an example where, at least one example, where there were Christians who did serve in the Roman military, but in non-combatant roles. And beyond that, I'm not aware. Basically, they were there, there to serve. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of, it's kind of like, have you ever seen, uh, what was it, Hacksaw Ridge? Yes. Great movie, right? Uh -huh. but I mean, and, and on one level, I mean, I, I really appreciate that. That's a true story. I appreciate that guy's testimony. And my, my gosh, uh, my hat's off to him. I'm not sure I could have done that. You know, I think as a, as a pacifist or a nonviolent follower of Jesus, I personally would have just stayed in jail and said, uh, I'm just not going to participate in any way. He was determined to serve. Um, but just not to carry a weapon. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm glad for that witness because, you know, because of that witness, and he took a lot of persecution for that from his own soldiers, but he also won the respect of those soldiers. And uh, he demonstrated the compassion of Christ in pretty radical ways as a result. So there are some um, uh, church orders. They might be like what we would call a statement of beliefs, you know, that are, written for a whole family of churches. So it's not just one individual's uh, point of view. Um, there are some some church writings from the first few centuries that um, talk about how the professions and the trades of those who are, want to be welcomed into the, into the church, into the community, need to be examined. Um, and they'll list multiple occupations, and they they usually say if you're in the army, they must they must leave. Or near the time of Constantine, they sort of say they start to say that they either must leave or refuse to kill. Um, but one of the you asked about like political uh, roles if they could be in those positions, and uh, one of the things that they were firm on was saying if a position 
uh, would require you to even give the word for someone to be killed, you cannot be in that position. So a judge sort of role. Uh, well, so that may, I mean, a police officer. Yeah. Right. Well, in the in in the early church, I'm sorry, in the church, in the early uh, in the Roman Empire, um, there wasn't really a distinction between cop and soldier. Like, yeah, if you were in the Roman military, you were either or. You were either keeping the peace, you know, in the city as a police officer might, or you were out in the battlefield and you might do both depending on who sent you where. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have anything else you want to add before I let you go? I, I just wanted to read something if I could. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not long. It's not very long. Um, if anyone knows me, they know I love David Bentley Hart. He's one of my heroes. Uh, he wrote a, um, a new translation of the New Testament which I really, really love. And in the introduction to the New Testament uh, translation that he wrote, he has this little paragraph I want to read about the early Christians. And it says this. He says, Throughout the history of the church, Christians have keenly desired to believe that the New Testament affirms the kind of people they are, rather than, as is actually the case, the kind of people they are not and really would not want to be. Again, the first, perhaps most crucial thing to understand about the earliest generations of Christians is that theirs was an association of extremists, radical in its rejection of the values and priorities of society, not only at its most degenerate, but often at its most reasonable and decent also. They were rabble. They lightly cast off all their prior loyalties and attachments, religion, empire, nation, tribe, even family. In fact, far from teaching family values, Christ was remarkably dismissive of the family and decent civic order, like social respectability, was apparently of no importance to him. Not only did he promise his followers worldly success, sorry, not only did he not promise his followers worldly success, even success in making things better for others, he told them to hope for a kingdom not of this world, and promised them that in this world they would win only rejection, persecution, tribulation, and failure. Yet he instructed them also to take no thought for the, for the morrow. And this apparently was the pattern of life of earliest Christians. And then, then I'm going to jump down real quick. He says, um, uh, but as a rule, very few can live like that or can imitate that obstinacy and perversity. To live as the New Testament language really requires, Christians would have to become strangers and sojourners on the earth, to have here no enduring city, to belong to a kingdom truly not of this world. And that seems a very great deal to ask. That's great. Yeah, I just love that because he, he you know, I think it is worth noting that they those guys were radical in ways we can only dream of. <laughs> and um and it is something I think we have to be honest. There's it's breathtaking in some ways how radical those earliest Christians were. And we've lost that, unfortunately. Do you think we can ever get it back? I hope so, man. I really do. Um I mean, on the personal level, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to to find ways to uh move back in that direction. It is it is a challenge because um we definitely do live in a world where it's so much more convenient uh, to continue to be a part of the system. We're born into it, so it's really difficult, I think, um, to find ways to live outside of it in ways that honor Christ, and yet, uh, you know, it doesn't compromise our faith in some way. I don't. I'm under no illusion that I'll probably see any of this happen in my lifetime. But I, what we're doing is it's still going to be out there even long after I'm gone. And hopefully people will pick up on it later. I always take it back to this. And in my study of the Constitution, it's something that Samuel Adams said. He said, well, you know, what they were doing was for posterity. So what we're doing, you know, us having this conversation is probably for, you know, more for the people, uh, the children to come or, you know, the people in the future that are going to start waking up to our, our awful situation and start looking for a better, a better way. And that better way is Jesus Christ. If I could jump in on that question, do you think we'll ever get back to that? Um, I think one of the missing ingredients, and this would be a whole different topic, but though certainly related, is the, the need for community. Um, not just this gather for an, an hour or now an hour online <laughs> with your church community, but true community. Um, my, my friend Dave Andrews likes to say, you know, one person can talk about the love of Christ and others can listen and at best say, okay, now I think I understand Christ's love. Two people committed to loving each other as Christ has loved them can demonstrate the love of Christ, and others can observe it. And at best, they can say, okay, now I've seen the love of Christ in action. But once you have at least three people committed to loving each other and living out the kingdom ways, 
uh, it creates a space, think of like a triangle, right? It creates a space into which others can come and enter in and actually experience the love of Christ. No longer just hear about it or see it, but actually experience it. Mm. And that's something that the early church really had going was this deep commitment to each other as a community to embody and actually live out these kingdom values, not just talk about them. Um, you you read from a book from Eberhard Arnold, who started a, a Christian community movement called the Bruderhof, which is celebrating 100 years uh, this year, started in Germany, persecuted and kicked out because of their refusal uh, to, to support the Nazis. Um, they have a common person. They share everything. You know, they're trying to, uh, in their own way, I, I think there may be about 3,000 members kind of throughout a few wow. different countries. Um, That's great. But, the, you know, there are groups, uh, Keith, the, your house churches, the missional communities I've been a part of, they're saying, we want to try to embody and live out. Um, and again, my friend Dave Angies would say, you know, on our best of days, we approximate the kingdom of God on earth. Most days we parody it. <laughs> That's great, man. I appreciate y'all doing this. This has been an awesome conversation. I think it's going to go over well with our listeners too. It's, uh, Keith, won't you go ahead and plug anything you want to plug? And then, uh, Jason, you do as well, then I'll let y'all get out of here. Yeah. Well, thank you. First of all, Craig and Jason, thank you so much for even wanting to have a conversation like this. It's such it's, it's a rare thing, um, and I'm excited to, to have, have an opportunity to talk about these things. And I hope it has been something inspiring to people listening, and you know, inspires them to go and look out, seek out, so, you know, uh, Jason's book and and Eberhard Arnold's book, Early Christians in Their Own Words, which really impacted me uh, in this area. It's a great book. So yeah, I'm. You know, if you're curious about any of the things I've written, you know, we mentioned my book, Jesus Untangled, which is about crucifying our politics to pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Uh, that book is available on Amazon, print, Kindle, or audiobook. Um, I have a series of books in the Jesus Un series. Uh, those are also all on Amazon as well and also available on um, all, th- all three of those formats. Uh, I blog at Pathios. Um, you can find that at, just at my name, KeithGiles.com. And um, I also do a podcast called The Heretic Happy Hour with two other guys, uh, and we get to model what it looks like to love one another and still disagree, uh, which is a rare thing as well, uh, every single episode, you know, so we get to love one another, respect one another, even though we don't always agree about everything. And so that's a lot of fun as a Heretic Happy Hour podcast. And yeah, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and um, I'm always accessible in those places. So love to love to meet you and talk with you. I, I started listening to the Heretic Happy Hour last week a little bit, and so I was scrolling through the through the shows, and of course, with what, what I'm doing with this project, the the first thing I that I that I saw that that drew me into it was t- y'all were talking about politics, and so of course I'm going to click on this one. Let's 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 listen to this and. At the end, y'all were, I don't, I can't remember. One guy's name is Jamal. Yeah, Jamal and Matt. One of them, he was talking about how uh, voting and stuff, and he was for it. And then Jamal kind of came, I don't know if it was Jamal. One of them, the other guy came in and said, well, I'm more libertarian, maybe almost anarchist. And I started cheering. And then, but he kind of, kind of waved away from it. And there comes my guy, Keith Giles. (laughs) <laughs> to just kind of destroy all of it and say, basically say, no, we're not supposed to be involved in any of this. And I was like, yes, I was, I, I listened to this on my commute back oh, and forth to great. work and I was cheering because there comes Key to, to <laughs> drop a stick of dynamite yeah. in the middle of all of oh, it. <laughs> all right, Jason, go ahead and. Yeah, well, again, it's like you said, Keith, it's just been a joy. I've been, this has been a, a stellar conversation. So thank you, Craig, for organizing it. Um, like Craig mentioned at the start of the episode, I, I have a sh- very uh, short little ebook that's almost entirely just the quotes from the early church. You can get that at jasonporterfield.com and download that for free. Um, what I'm really excited about, what I've been working on for the last two years, is um, a book that will probably be about another year before it's published and out. Um, that it it goes through each day of Holy Week, so Jesus's last week, and it looks at how Jesus tackled injustice, loved enemies, and contended for peace throughout his final days. And that book came about because when I was living uh, in Canada's poorest neighborhood and a lot of drug issues, a lot of, of violence. Um, but the trial began three weeks after I arrived for Canada's most prolific serial killer, Robert Picton. And over the past 10 years, he had uh, butchered and fed to his pigs the bodies of 49 women from my neighborhood. And uh, that experience just crushed me. You know, I moved to that neighborhood thinking I'm a peacemaker. I'm going to work for the flourishing of this community. 
And it didn't take long before my community's brokenness broke me. Uh, I had no idea how to be a peacemaker. And uh, long story short, Holy Week really became my manual for understanding how do you go about peacemaking. A lot of lessons, such as ones we've talked about, that peacemaking is not passive, it's not doing nothing. Um, and so, you know, we normally think of the Sermon on the Mount when we think of Jesus and peacemaking. Um, beautiful thing about Holy Week is we get to see Jesus actually put into action all of his past teaching. Uh, and so I'm excited for that book. It's about a year away. Uh, but yeah. That sounds great. That's good. That's a, that's good. I, I want to I want to pick that up. Maybe we can have you back on. We can talk about it a little bit. That would be fun. Um, I want to mention, too, before we go uh, with this ebook that you put together, um, I have four people. There's four people that, that help with our the Bad Roman Project, and they, they make memes for our Facebook page. And I thought it was a cool idea. And I, I asked them to take some of these quotes out of this ebook make some memes out of it. And it really brings these quotes to life. And we had some awesome feedback with these memes. People really enjoyed what was, you know, what we were putting together with that. And these, these people that are putting the memes together are very creative with it too. And it was, it was pretty cool. I don't know if y'all had a chance to see them. I think I've sent, I've sent some to you, Jason, but I've posted some as well on Facebook on my personal page as well, but really, really good stuff. Yeah, they're great. All right, guys. Thanks so much for having us on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll do it again for sure. Thank you. All right. Y'all have a good day. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about the Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. (laughs) 